Okay, here we go. Here's our next phylum. Um, we're going to be jumping into phylum Nematoda, but before we talk about the nematodes, we got to talk about um, superphylum, or sometimes also called clade ectocoa. Um, so these nematodes and the arthropods are going to be in clade, ec uh, clade or superphylum ectocoa. So what that means is that these are organisms that must shed their exoskeleton. They have a cuticle. Um, it's called an exoskeleton. Arthropods that it must be shed, and that that cuticle is um, composed of chitin. All right, that really tough material, the same material that we saw in the fungi. So this is something that has been, uh, that evolved independently twice. Okay. Um, so the two phyla in this um, superphylum Actisozoa are going to be the nematodes and the arthropods. Okay, so that's their key characteristics, why they're grouped together. It's because they have that exoskeleton, that cuticle that they must shed. All right, so phylum nematoda. Um, so these are the roundworms, also commonly called roundworms. Nematos in Greek means thread-like, and that's where they get their name. Um, so these organisms, um, they are triploblastic, they have a complete digestive system. So unlike the platyhelminthes that we talked about just a second ago, um, these nematodes do have openings at both ends of their digestive system. They lack a circulatory system though, so this is one of the reasons why they tend to be pretty small. It's because all materials um, need to move through their body, basically through diffusion. Um, so these organisms, these nematodes, they have a body cavity, but it is a fake body cavity, a pseudocelum. So that means that it's a um, space between the endoderm and the mesoderm tissue. Their body cavity is not lined by mesoderm. This is an incredibly diverse group. Um, many are free living, many are also parasitic. Um, so nematodes tend to live in areas where there's plenty of water. So they're found in both terrestrial, aquatic, um, freshwater or marine. Um, environments, as long as there's enough um, moisture around that they can kind of wiggle their way through. Um, there's some estimates that these nematodes make up about 90% of all animal species on the ocean floor. Um, there's about, some other people think that there's approximately 60 billion nematodes for each human on our planet. Um, nematodes are everywhere, and they're in the soil, they're living all around us, they're living all over the oceans. Um, they're incredibly, incredibly common. Um, and now they're, they're in uh, rich arboreal forest soil, you can find thousands of nematodes in just one mil of soil. So one milliliter of soil can have thousands of microscopic nematodes living in them. Okay. <clears throat> so these are mostly, they kind of eat a lot of different things. Some are fungivores, some are tritivores, eating dead things. Um, some will eat bacteria, some feed on the roots of plants. They're very, very diverse in how they um, go about getting their food. So the parasitic species, nematodes are parasites of humans, are also parasites of plants, um, animals, insects, they're parasites of almost anything that you can think of probably. Um, so one that we're going to look at in lab is uh, trichinellus viralis, so that causes the disease known as trichinosis. Um, this is a parasite of humans as well as uh, pigs that is acquired through undercooked pork. So it, these um, spiral worms, so they sometimes create a spiral structure to them as they're insisted in the muscle tissue, um, and that's where it gets its name, that spiral, uh, trichinellus viralis. So, if undercooked pork that is infected with this with this nematode, Trichinellus viralis, is consumed, um, then the human would also get that disease as well. And it typically presents as like red bumps or almost looks like hives in muscle tissue in humans. I mean, it's incredibly painful. Um, pinworms, hookworms, whipworms, these are also very common parasites of mammals and humans. Um, there's also some interesting um, parasites of, nematodes are also interesting parasites of arthropods. So there was a newly discovered nematode parasite um, that induces fruit mimicry in a tropical ant. Okay, so this nematode will infect the ant. Um, once it's infected the ant, what happens is the abdomen of the ant becomes inflamed and becomes bright red. Um, and it tends to walk very slowly, but it holds its abdomen up in an elevated position. Um, and so they think that this um, inflamed red abdomen that's being held up tricks birds into confusing that 
ant as a fruit, as a berry, um, and then the bird eats the ant with the nematode that's insisted in it, um, and then the parasite's eggs are passed through the bird, through its feces, and then it's picked up again by the ant. So kind of a crazy life cycle there. Um, nematodes can also be um, parasites of plants, um, either parasitize the root nodules of the plants or the roots themselves. Um, uh, many nematodes will also, if they're eating on the roots of a plant, they can sometimes transmit plant viruses, so they can act as a vector to transmit the viruses of plants as well. So they're incredibly common, very diverse lifestyles for both parasitic and free living. Um, but one famous free living nematode is the nematode C. elegans. Um, so this is a model organism, so that means that we've mapped its genome, we've um, mapped its developmental process, so we can trace where each of their cells in its adult stage come from, um, and we've mapped out how it divides and the fate of each of those cells at these dividing. Um, so and it's really easy to grow in the lab, which is helpful. Um, so his, here's what C. elegans looks like. This is what most nematodes look like as well as they're moving through their environment. So we see it does have a complete digestive system. There's the other end. Okay, and they're very small. So some can get very large, like the Ascaris. Okay, um, and here's what it looks like as it's developing. This is a time lapse. So we've been able to trace the fate of each of these cells and figure out, okay, this one's gonna become a neuron, this one's gonna become part of its cuticle. How they differentiate which is really helpful because now we can start to play with genes, um, knock out certain genes, maybe add in some other genes, um, and then we could see what does that gene do? How does this gene function? Um, and this is also um, being helpful using this nematode because they don't have as many Hox genes as some other farm of animals. Um, so they don't have as many of these Hox genes to play with, and so we think that they have, we can, it's easier to determine what each Hox gene does. All right, so that's the nematodes. Again, they're part of superphylum ecdysozoa. They have a complete digestive system. They're incredibly diverse, very ubiquitous, very common. Um, and they're both parasites of plants, animals, humans, um, as well as many free living species that are incredibly important for the recycling of dead material.